Okay, so we're done with the late classical period and we're moving into the Hellenistic period, which is the last period that we'll go over in the Greek um, chapter. And the Hellenistic period is a much more diverse and complex uh, time period. The diversity is really reflected in the art from the Hellenistic period. And a lot of the architecture during this period was constructed in the Eastern Greek territories instead of on the Greek mainland, which was the norm in earlier time periods. Uh, so a lot of the major architecture was outside of the Peloponnesos or the Greek mainland during the Hellenistic period. So as you can see, the first temple that we will have a look at was constructed in Eastern Greek territory of what is now present-day Turkey. So some of the characteristics of the Hellenistic are present in this early Hellenistic temple design. Basically the grand scale, the theatrical element of surprise, and the willingness to, to actually break the traditional rules of temple design are all present in this temple which are things that are common during the Hellenistic period. Hellenistic period traits, I guess I should say, in architecture. So this is called the Temple of Apollo at um, Didyma, uh, Turkey, 300 BCE. And this temple replaced the early archaic temple that was destroyed by the Persians when they tried to invade Greece. And the temple was actually built by two architects from the area, um, Paeonios of Ephesus and Daphnius of Mil Miltos. And this was a hugely ambitious building project. In fact, it was added to for over 500 years, and it was still never quite completed. Um, <clears throat> the temple had a double row of columns, which is deptural, called the deptural colonnade. You can kind of see some of them here, um, but it, it went all the way around two rows of columns and its short end featured 10 columns, which is definitely a break from the strict rules of temple design because this is a bit wide for a canonical temple anyway. And the sides had 21 columns, which is consistent with the mathematical formula used on the Parthenon, but nothing else about this design is at all classical besides that. Uh, mathematical equation um, of the 10 columns to the 21 columns on the side. So this temple was actually open to the sky and it had no roof. Um, and that's called hypatherol. And it didn't have any of those triangular shaped pediments either. Um, the pediments were the traditional area where uh, sculptures would be found, relief sculptures. But the rule was thrown out with this temple. Also, the doorway that led to the temple's interior cella was nearly five feet off the ground and could not be entered. And some historians believe this served as a stage where the Oracle of Apollo would announce to assemblies in the front of the temple. Um, so inside the double colonnade is a central courtyard instead of the traditional uh, cella. I think I might have a plan here. Okay, here's the courtyard, the double colonnade. Here's the five foot wall here in the entrance. Um, where they think the oracle may have um, addressed people from. Um, they call it the oracle or, or oracular room, sorry. Um, and then, <clears throat> let's see, where were we? And inside the courtyard was a small shrine building that had a statue of Apollo inside. So here's the inner shrine, little building area that had Apollo inside of it. And the entrance into the courtyard can only be obtained through small entrances to the right and left of the stage. So I believe these are the entrances and you'd walk through here possibly. I think that's where it's at. Um, to the right and the left of the stage, which I believe this is the stage up here. So actually opposite of the shrine was a kind of a large wide uh, staircase. And um, the stair stairway was actually 50 feet wide and it rose up to three portals leading to the oracular room. And this is kind of a complex space and this temple features a very different plan from those classical Greek temples that we looked at before. And the different plan probably had to do with the fact that they had an oracle here. So supposedly there was a priestess that sat above the oracle spring um, 
there was an actual water spring located somewhere in the central courtyard. And this spring brought messages and inspiration from the god Apollo, supposedly to this oracle. And then from the stage, the messages were relayed to the cloud, the crowd that gathered in front of the temple, which I believe would have been around this area. Um, <clears throat> So kind of an interesting design for a temple and a very interesting use for a temple as well. And just another example of how the Hellenistic period kind of broke with a lot of the traditional things that went on. So Stoa and city planning. The Stoa was a versatile, secular, non-religious building that the Greeks used that housed offices and shops during the late classical and the Hellenistic periods. And they, cover, they covered them with colonnades or porticos. So if we see, see this piece here, um, I think this is a stoa of Atelos II looking southeast, the Agora, which is the central area where people had their shops, um, Athens, Greece, 150 BCE. Um, it was gifted to the city from the king of Pergamon, who had studied in Athens in his youth. And this stoa has been restored. And you can tell from this picture that it has been restored. It looks pretty pretty nice. The stoa actually has two stories. Each story has 21 shops that open into this colonnade here. Um, the columns are much more widely spaced than temple columns. This is to allow for crowds moving in and out to have easy access. Also, the lower third of the columns were left unfluted to guard against damage from passing people constant foot traffic, um, that kind of thing. And the facade columns are Doric on the ground level and Ionic on the second story. So the facade is the exterior of the building. So they're Doric down here, Ionic up here on the second story. And the mixing of the two orders on a single side of a building, building became very common place in the Hellenistic period. So during the classical, we had Doric and Iconic, but they were typically Doric on the outside and Ionic on the inside. Here we have both Doric and Ionic on the outside, which is a Hellenistic period um, thing that's going on. It's very eclectic, all on one side. Um, and the desire for variety and decoration really drove the Hellenistic artist architects. So they threw out a lot of the old rules from the high classical period and just kind of went with whatever they thought was the most decorative thing they could do. Um, so we'll take a look at Pergamon. Um, the Pergamon king was, kingdom was founded after the breakup of Alexander the Great's empire. And the kingdom spanned over almost all the western and south, southern Asia Minor, basically. So this was all over Asia Minor. And after the death of its last king, the Pergamon empire was bequeathed to Rome. And the Pergamon kingdom had enjoyed great wealth and used much of it to um, embellished their city of Pergamon and its Acropolis. And the altar of Zeus was located at the Acropolis, which was on the high hill at Pergamon. Um, so this is what we're going to look at. The altar of Zeus at Pergamon was built in 175 BCE. Um, it's in, you know, it was found in present day Turkey. And this is a reconstruction of the West Front, and it's now in a museum in Berlin, Germany. And as you can see, it's built up on this platform here and features ionic capitals with a symmetrical plan. So if we divided this in half, um, it would be symmetrical. And these wings jut out on either side of the grand staircase and around this building, there is some, there are some 400 feet of sculpted area here um, around the building. So there's 400 feet of area where they added sculpture and this this area depicts Zeus and the gods fighting the giants. So this whole thing is, you know, the Greeks and Zeus fighting the giants, which is Gigantomachy. It's a very common theme that we have seen in the Greek culture. And this time on the altar of Zeus, the Gigantomachy depicted the, and symbolized the Greek overthrow of the Gauls. Um, the Gauls were basically Celtic tribes and um, it would be what is now present day France and Belgium and most of Switzerland and parts of Northern Italy, the Netherlands and Germany. So the Gauls come from that area. And in the third century BCE, the Greeks successfully turned back an invasion of the Gauls in Asia Minor. And the motif was also borrowed from the Parthenon. 
So remember how the Parthenon used Gigantomachy to symbolize the, symbolize the victory of Athens over Persia? Well, they're using that here on the altar of Zeus, except this time they're um, they're actually using Gigantomachy to symbolize the Greeks overthrowing the Gauls. Although the sculpture included on the altar of Zeus at Pergamon has parallels to the High Classical, um, it does have differences, one being that the scenes depicted at Pergamon are full of a lot of emotional intensity that was not present in the classical scenes that we saw in the Panthenon, Parthenon. And the battle rages everywhere, even spilling into the steps. So I believe there's areas where it spills out into the steps. Um, and there's a lot of violence, swirling, drapery, vivid depictions of suffering. They're all common on the altar of Zeus. So we'll take a look at some of these. So this is Athena battling Alkinoios. Um, Alkinoios, detail of Gigantomachy, frieze, altar of Zeus, 175 BCE, marble, seven feet, six inches high. So it's pretty big. Here's a detail from the frieze that depicts um, Athena grabbing the hair of a giant as victory f flies in to crown her. So this is Victory here. She's going to crown her. She's got this giant, uh, his hair in her hand. She's, you know, basically winning here. And um, Gaia, the earth goddess, the mother of the giants, is coming up from the ground and is looking on in horror as her offspring are basically slaughtered. So this is Gaia right here, the earth goddess. Uh, she's the mother of the giants. And so she's pretty upset because the giants are being slaughtered by the gods and the goddesses of ancient Greece. So as you can see, this is a different than the what we saw in the Parthenon. It's very there's a lot more movement here. There's a lot more violence. There's a lot more emotion written on the faces of the figures. So Epinotos, um, this is a they think that's who did this. A Gallic chieftain killing himself and his wife. A Roman copy of a bronze statue, two thirty to two twenty BCE, marble, six feet eleven inches high. So this is um, some of the dying Gauls that we'll look at. These happen to be some of my personal favorite statues um, from the whole chapter on ancient Greece. There's just something about them that I find fascinating. And they're actually earlier in date than the sculptures found in the altar of Zeus. Um, the ones that survive are Roman copies. And this is thought that the Greek originals were probably done in bronze. And they were probably originally commissioned by King Atelos I of Pergamon to commemorate his victory over the Gauls in the 3rd century BCE. So this Hellenistic sculpture um, is successful in really capturing the distinctive features of the Gauls. Um, they had long bushy hair, mustaches, that was quite foreign to the Greeks, and they wore um, torques or neckbands. And they also included these in the sculptures. Um, you can't really see the neckband on him, but you can see their hair and some of the ways that they dressed. And so it's pretty cool that they were able to capture the features of the Gauls so accurately. In this piece, the Gallic, Gallic chieftain is actually driving a sword into his own chest, and he'd rather die than surrender, which is what's being shown here. And if he had been captured, he and his wife would have been sold as slaves. So um, a lot of the Gallic chieftains and the Gallic people killed themselves if they did not win the battle, obviously. And this is thought to be an act of bravery back in the day. So the Greeks are actually kind of showing that the Gallic people or Gallic people are brave people. And you, uh, you're kind of invited to walk around the sculpture to really enjoy it to its fullest. And this is something that the great sculptor Lysippos developed during the late classical period. And from one side, you can see the intense expression of the Gallic chieftain's face. And then from another, you can see the limp body of his wife. And so the man is kind of twisting, his posture is twisting. Um, which creates movement and the suicidal act all combine to create this emotional intensity that only Hellenistic art um, achieved. Let me check and see how much time I have on my... Okay, I'm running out of time, but um, we'll continue forth with Hellenistic art in the next video.